Now that we've explored how neural networks operate and how to make them fast, it's time to start exploring how to scale them up to solve big problems. And that means adding more layers to our networks. But as soon as our neural nets start getting deeper, we can run into some problems during training caused by vanishing or exploding gradients. Let's start by thinking about a deep neural network with sigmoid activations for the hidden layers. There are several different ways we could visualize what such a network computes. In previous videos, I've drawn all of the nodes and all of the edges in the network, but when we start thinking about deep networks with potentially hundreds of nodes in a layer and dozens of layers, that's not at all practical. So here I've switched to a block diagram where each column represents a layer of the network and we've indicated the activation functions within each block. And for now we'll still assume dense connections, meaning that every node in one layer is connected to every node in the next. Another way we could visualize this neural network is in the computational graph shown at the top. This graph shows the sequence of operations that gets applied to each batch of data. We start with a matrix of inputs, and we multiply the weight matrix from layer 1 to layer 2 by those inputs, which I'll indicate by this asterisk operation. And then we add the vector of biases to every column, which I'll indicate by this plus. And that produces the inputs x2 that go into the activation function at layer 2. Then we apply the layer 2 activation function, which produces our matrix of activations at layer 2. From layer 2 to 3, we have the same sequence of operations performing a matrix multiplication, then adding the vector of biases and applying the activation function. And this proceeds through each of the hidden layers in the network. When we get to the output layer, the activation function changes to a softmax. And then we can think of the loss as being computed from the activations of the output layer and the targets for this batch. This computational graph makes much more explicit the sequence of operations that we're performing, and it can also make it easier to think about what derivatives we need to take on the backward pass. And so we'll see these computation graphs a lot throughout the rest of the course. But yet another way to think about our computations during training would be to write out mathematical expressions for the loss and for the deltas that we will use to perform our gradient descent updates. The loss results from this entire chain of computations through the graph, and so our functions start from our first matrix multiplication with the input batch. To get our inputs for the first hidden layer, we multiply the weight matrix by the input batch matrix and add the bias. That weighted sum then becomes the input to the first hidden layer's sigmoid activation function. Those activations then get multiplied by the weights from layer 2 to 3, and we add the layer 3 bias. And this is now an expression for computing the inputs to layer 3, to which we again apply a sigmoid activation function. And this proceeds through the hidden layers each time the output of one hidden layer gets multiplied by the weight matrix and we add the bias, and that becomes the input to the next. Once we have an expression for the last hidden layer's activations, we still multiply by weights and add the bias, but now we apply the output layer's softmax activation. Then the output activations, along with the targets, become the inputs to the categorical cross-entropy calculation that gives us the loss. Writing out this gigantic expression for the loss makes clear that when we're trying to compute derivatives, we're going to have to apply the chain rule a whole bunch of times.
And to really drive the point home, let's write out an expression for the deltas on the first hidden layer. Our delta calculations start from the output layer, and since we're using softmax with categorical cross-entropy, our output layer deltas are just the difference between activations and targets. To propagate deltas backwards, at each hidden layer, we need to do a matrix multiplication with the transpose of the weight matrix, and then an element-wise multiplication with the derivative of the activation function. So to get the deltas at layer 5, we start by multiplying with the transpose of the weights from 5 to 6. And then we element-wise multiply with the derivative of the activations for layer 5. Then to go from layer 5 to layer 4, we have the same sequence of operations. And this proceeds backwards through all of the hidden layers. And so for every layer we propagate derivatives through, we multiply by both the weights and the derivative of the activations. So the question is, why does this cause a problem when training deep neural networks? Well, because we're using sigmoid activation functions for our hidden layers in this network, each time we propagate backwards, we're multiplying by the derivative of a sigmoid. And unfortunately, the derivative of a sigmoid function tends to have very small values. Its maximum output is 0.25, and for much of its range, the output is much smaller still. And this means that if we multiply by sigmoid activations repeatedly every time we go backwards through the network, our deltas will tend to get smaller and smaller at each successive layer. And this is known as the vanishing gradient problem. The reason vanishing gradients are a problem is that when we start training a neural network, it's computing a completely random function because we have chosen random initial values for the weight matrices. And because a deep neural network applies many random weight matrices to the inputs, by the time data gets to the end of the network, it has been pretty thoroughly scrambled. And so, the information that we get from the loss function computed on the targets has to propagate back through the network, and it's particularly important to update the weights for these early layers that are being applied most directly to the input, but if the gradients have vanished by the time we get to the early layers, then when we take gradient descent steps, we will be only making extremely tiny changes to these weights, and so it will be very hard to move these first few weight matrices away from just being random and scrambling the data. Prior to the 2010s, sigmoids were the most popular activation function for neural networks. And so the vanishing gradient problem was a big obstacle to training deep neural networks. And a big part of the reason that deep learning took off around a decade ago was that a few different approaches were devised to overcome the vanishing gradient problem. One of the ways we can counteract vanishing gradients is by changing our initialization of the weight matrices. Since every layer that we backpropagate through multiplies by a sigmoid derivative and also the transpose of the weight matrix, if we generate larger initial random weights, that will tend to increase the magnitude of the deltas. And if we've chosen those weights properly, that could counteract the decreasing of the deltas from the derivative. But the solution that really made deep neural networks take off is switching away from sigmoid activations towards rectifier linear units. Because the ReLU activation function has a derivative of 1 whenever it has non-zero output, 
multiplying by ReLU derivatives instead of sigmoid derivatives tends to squish the gradients much less. And this is the number one reason why ReLU activations became more popular than sigmoids. But when we replace our sigmoid activations with rectifier linear units, we now have a potential problem in the other direction. Specifically because the ReLU derivative tends not to reduce the deltas as we go backwards, it's possible that if the weight matrices have particularly large values, then as we go backwards, the deltas could get larger and larger. And this is known as exploding gradients. Much like vanishing gradients resulted in taking gradient descent steps that were far too small, exploding gradients mean that we will take gradient descent steps that are way too big. If gradient descent takes gigantic steps, that may not result in moving down the loss landscape at all, and so there may be no way to effectively train the network. So if we're using ReLU neurons, we generally want to choose smaller initial weights than we would with sigmoids. The takeaway messages here are that ReLU neurons work great for hidden layers because they make the network easier to train, not to mention because computing both the activation and the derivative is extremely efficient, and that the best way to generate random initial weights can be different for different types of activation functions. But lucky for us, the deep learning community has put a lot of work into determining the best way to initialize weights for different types of layers. And so if we're using a modern deep learning library, we can take for granted that the weight initialization will be done appropriately for the type of activations that we specify.